and let's sing together. Oh, we look to the sun. Do 
hey, hey. Hey, hey, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you. You look all nice. I got my velvet jacket. I literally only wear this like twice a year. I wear it at Christmas. So, well, actually, sometimes at November in Valentine's Day, sometimes but also November. this is my... This is my Valentine's jacket. Where'd you get that from? I got that from the Old Navy. Well, look at that. <laughs> Shout out to Old Navy. Hey, hey. We ain't getting paid. No, it should Wish. be a thing popping up you can right pay here. pay me in uh, Old Navy bucks. <laughs> That's <so>. right. <laughs> hey, if you are here for the first time, we love that you are here. Yeah. And we have a challenge for you. It's very simple. We say check us out three times, pray, and listen yeah. and see if this is where God is asking you to go spiritually. Yes. And you can keep track of that on the communication card. Yeah. Yeah, you can let us know uh, that you're doing the three-point challenge. The connection card is on thepointchurch.net slash connect. And on that same space, you'll actually have a place in to pop in your prayer requests if you do have one. We are a church that really, really, really believes in the power of yes. prayer. And so let us know what, whatever you got going on that you need prayer over. We absolutely want to know. So we get to know you. Yes. Oh, yeah. And we can pray for you and yes. love on you. Also, uh, focus on the fort. Yes, we're doing diapers for Kara's Diet. house. All mm -hmm. sizes. So yes. Just bring those in into the foyer. There'll be a large bucket, yes. uh, a large barrel that you can fill those things yes. up. I see we have some out there right now. So yes. continue to bring those in. Uh, the women love that. It's a yeah. it's a, uh, a ministry here in town that helps women and their children that are homeless to get back on their feet. So just continue to bring those in for care. Yes, house. yes, absolutely. And then also today's a great day because we're celebrating baptism. Yes, we are. Baptism. So if you want to get in on the next baptism, really baptism is just a way to like show your faith, show, mm -hmm. show the, the decision you just made for Christ. Yes. Um, and so so if we would love to help you do that, just do the same thing. The connection card is where it's at, or you can let us know in the chat box. March fourteenth. Yep. Because there's twenty eight days in February, so February and March mimic each other on days. So oh, it's March fourteenth. So You're so knowledgeable about that. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and then also next week's like a big week. Yes, because it is. we're coming back home. That's right. Welcome yeah. home. Welcome home service next week. All three services, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So we'll be virtual as well. So for any of you who are just loving this virtual experience, you're not quite ready to like yep. venture out. We got you. So no That's worries. Right. We'll still be streaming online, all three services as well. But it'll be mm -hmm. really good to be back. It will be. I miss yeah. people. We just miss, I miss people. people. We miss you. It's the woo in us. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes. yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's, that's all. It. Yep. Yep. Can, can, I, can I pray you, us out? You can pray us out. All right. Hey, yes. God, thank you so much, Lord, for uh, today. And we're looking forward uh, to seeing this decision, the baptism uh, that we get to see and witness someone stepping out for you in boldness. And we thank you for that. Yeah. Father, we're so excited to get back on the campus, Lord, just back home uh, and see people again live. Uh, Lord, we just know that you've done wonderful things and amazing things. Your kingdom has advanced in so many ways uh, through what we've been doing online. And Lord, yes. you're calling us back home again uh, to do it here on yeah. campus too. And we thank you for that. Right. Father, we just love you and we praise you. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. my friend Sandy Johnston. And Sandy wanted me to tell you, I'm an avid reader. Many years before the internet, I was telling a friend about a book I read and what a great book it was, but I could not remember the book's name or the author. I never asked God anything about the book. Sometime later, I stopped in a bookstore because they were running a sale. As I walked in the door, I had to walk right or left because straight ahead was the sale table. And there, right on the dis prominently displayed, was the book, the one that I had recommended. So even though I can't remember the name of the book now, I always remember God's kindness in leading me to that bookstore and how much he cared to reach down and intervene in this situation. So I expect God to do big stuff. After all, the Bible tells us about God's creations, his love for us, how he gave his son for us. Before book day, I thought all of that in more general terms, kind of as a group. He took the time to show me about a, a, a print book. It was that moment I realized how much God cares for us as individuals, that he truly is our father and we are his children. And so, Sandy, based upon your testimony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. On television, Family Feuds appear to be, you know, simple games where everyone leaves smiling. 
a host introduces two families that are all smiling and cheering, hugging and kissing each other as they play against another family, a friendly family for prizes and awards. And let me tell you, real life family feuds are not fun, plain and simple. Sometimes they continue even from generation to generation. Take, for example, the notorious Hatfield and McCoy feud. Few notes on this true story. It hit the newspaper front pages in the 1880s when the Hatfield clan feuded with the McCoy clan from across the border in Kentucky. Historians disagree on the cause of the feud, which captured the imagination of the entire nation during, get this, a 10-year run. Unfortunately, as many as 100 men, women, and children died during all this. And in May 1876, Jim McCoy and Willis Hatfield, the last two, participated in a ceremony dedicating a monument to six of the victims. McCoy died February 11, 1984, at age 99. He bore no grudges and actually had his burial handed by the Hatfield Funeral Home in Kentucky. There was a great disagreement even among the Christians of the early church as to which of them would get special places of honor in God's kingdom or what rituals Gentile believers would adopt in order to become true believers. James and John sought special favors from Christ. The seeds of bitter rivalry were sown, but were quickly dispelled by Jesus. Of course, his message to them and to us today is that God, he loves us all and gives favor to whomever he pleases in whatever way he pleases. As Christians, we have learned to love our brothers and sisters and family members. We celebrate their accomplishments, we mourn their failures, and give God all the praise and glory. You know, there's something about peace, like you say the word, you could feel it. It's relaxing, isn't it? Beautiful. It's peaceful, right? Have you ever been in a disagreement with someone and actually worked it out? It might have been soon or it might have been way down the road, but that moment you work it out, you feel so great. Like that feeling you get when you get in your car or come home and you can actually take off your mask. (laughs) Peace. (sighs) Peace had just been lifted up off of you. Almost the result is so tangible to the point where you're saying, why didn't we do this sooner? In fact, my mom and her sister, who had been very close their whole lives, they had a disagreement once. And at one point, something was said in her home and a letter was written and their relationship came crashing down. It was two years before they spoke again. That was tough on them both. I I remember my mom reflecting on it at the time and how painful it was on her. But you know what? The moment that their relationship was reconciled, peace entered in. They were thick as thieves again (laughs) until my aunt passed away. You know, and that is peace coming from a very normal standpoint. As Christians, we have the ability to intercept God's peace. A peace that not only affects us now in the moment, but for all eternity. And that source of peace, well, it comes through Jesus. Now, obviously, we would want to pursue this peace because without peace, there's much turmoil. And the early church knew that well. And just as a few short weeks ago, uh, Ray, in this series, Unstoppable, he spoke about unity, the importance of unity, and the fact that the early Christians thrived when there was unity. Even when there were some disagreements, even though there were times where there were differences of opinions and thoughts, they worked it out. And we by no means are beyond that today. We still must work it out, put our differences aside, and and have the peace that truly matters. To follow up what Ray spoke regarding unity, what I want to give you today are four very practical steps on how to achieve that unity by making peace and conflict. The Hatfield and McCoys, they had conflict. James, John, and many believers had conflict. We will have conflict. Now that that is clear, what do we do as a result of that conflict? So I want to fast forward in the book of Acts, the book that we've been in during this study on how to become an unstoppable force with God. And one way is to have unstoppable unity. We jump into Acts chapter 15. Now we're going to fly through this, but keep in mind, this is a well-documented account that we need to pay attention to an important moment in church history, and it's called the Jerusalem Council of Apostles. Verse 1, while Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch, some false teachers came from Judea to trouble the believers. They taught, unless you are circumcised, as the law of Moses requires, you, you cannot be saved. 
Now, this sparked a fierce argument between the false teachers and Paul and Barnabas. So the church appointed a delegation of believers, including Paul and Barnabas, to go to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles and elders of the church to resolve the issue. So the church sent them on their way. As they passed through Samaria, they stopped to share with the believers how God was converting many from among the non-Jewish people. This was huge. The gospel spreading beyond the Jewish people to the Gentiles, to the Greeks and others. And hearing this report brought great joy to all the churches. When they finally arrived in Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders. They explained to them everything God had done among them. But there were some believers who were of the religious group, and they were called the separated ones, that they were insistent, saying we must continue the custom of circumcision and require that the people keep the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders, they met privately to discuss the matter further. And after a lengthy debate, Peter rose to his feet and he said to them, Brothers, you know how God has chosen me from the beginning to preach the wonderful news of the gospel to the non-Jewish nations. God, who knows the hearts of every person, confirmed this when he gave them the Holy Spirit, just like he has given the Spirit to us. So now, not one thing separates us as Jews and Gentiles, for when they believe, he makes their hearts pure. So why on earth would you now limit God's grace by placing a yoke of religious duties on the shoulders of the believers that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Don't you believe that we are introduced to eternal life, the grace of our Lord Jesus, the same grace that has brought these people to new life? And just like that, everyone became silent and they listened carefully. As Paul and Barnabas shared with the council at length about the signs and the wonders and miracles God had worked through them while ministering to the non-Jewish people when they had finished. So. The leadership took the floor and said, ladies and gentlemen, listen, Peter has explained thoroughly that God is determined to win a people for himself from among the non-Jewish nations and the prophet's words are fulfilled. After these things, I will return to you and raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen into ruin. I'll restore and rebuild what David experienced so that all of humanity will be able to encounter the Lord, including the Gentiles whom I have called to be my very own, says the Lord, for I've made my will known. I may know my works from eternity. So in my judgment, we should not add any unnecessary burden to the non-Jewish converts who are turning to God. We will go to them as apostles and teach them to be set free from offering sacrifices to idols, sexual immorality, and eating anything strangled or with any blood. For many generations, These words of Moses have been proclaimed every Sabbath day in the synagogues. The apostles and the elders in the church of Jerusalem chose delegates to go to Antioch in Syria. And so they chose Bersabbas and Silas, both leaders to the church, to accompany Paul and Barnabas. They sent them with the letter greetings from the apostles and pastors and from your fellow believers and non-Jewish brothers and sisters that live in Antioch, in Syria and the nearby regions. We are aware that some have come to you from the church of Jerusalem. These men were not sent by us, but came with false teachings that have brought confusion and division, telling you to keep the law and be circumcised, things we never commanded them to teach. So after deliberation, we're sending you our beloved brothers, Paul and Barnabas, who have risked their lives for the glory of the name of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. They are accompanied by Silas and Barsabbas, whom we have chosen unanimously to send as our representatives to you. They will validate all that we're wanting to share with you, for it pleases the Holy Spirit and us that we not place any unnecessary burden on you, except for the following restrictions. Just stay away from anything that's sacrificed to a pagan eye, from eating or restoring order within your blood, and from any form of sexual immorality. You will be beautiful believers if you keep your souls from these things, and you'll be true and faithful to our Lord Jesus. May God bless you. You know, you could say in those moments, there was a storm, so to speak. You have these very religious group of believers who are coming in and mandating things to be done in order for others to become believers. You can almost call it a storm. And sometimes a storm appears everywhere. Today, we know through technology that a storm exists over just a city or maybe your side of town and it doesn't affect someone else. 
So storms don't really take up the whole sky. Charles Lindbergh, for example, he was known for his transatlantic solo flight. And at one point in his flight, he came upon a sudden storm. He couldn't turn his plane. It was called the Spirit of St. Louis. He couldn't turn it left or right. It seemed that the storm was everywhere until he did an unusual thing for his time. He took his plane up into the storm and above it, above the storm, he saw the sunshine. He was above the clouds. So you see, when these problems, when the opposite of peace rages in our lives, and sometimes with hurricane force, perhaps we too should soar above the storm so we can see the sun, or S-O-N, in Jesus. David said this, I will lift up my eyes into the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and earth. So when the storms of life come, lift up your eyes. You can see him and you can soar above it, riding on the wings of faith. So I tell you this, to say that to achieve this peace, we have to rise. We have to rise above the storm. We have to rise above our differences. And the storm may be conflict that you have, which brings disunity. Jesus never said we had to have it all together before we come to him. He just says, come, believe in me, be saved. I will transform you. I will make you a new creature. Just come. You don't have to check a bunch of boxes to receive Jesus' salvation. Say, I'm a sinner. I'm lost without you, God. Please forgive me. Make my life new. I believe you rose again from the dead. And that's what they were saying. To achieve peace, we need to forgive. Just as Jesus has forgiven us. Not only our enemies, but our closest friends and loved ones. Oscar Wilde, the famous author, he said, always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. Okay, well, <laughs> annoying should not be our goal here, but it is funny. So to take a dive into this passage, we see that there was a lot of cultural diversity in the world at the time, especially in the book of Acts. And even today, we call diversity a melting pot, but sometimes it becomes like a stew pot. We need to often return and relearn the lessons from this Jerusalem council. So when the group of religious believers, they were so bent on this thing about circumcision, Paul and Barnabas stood up and they disagreed. And they disagreed so strongly with the group that a sharp dispute arises. A conflict came. And when the church sees that the discussion is not producing a resolution, it orders them, hey, you need to take a delegation up to Jerusalem. This is important. We need to resolve this. We need to have clarity and restore unity among us. And that's the appropriate response. Sometimes we get to an impasse with each other, with someone that you've had a disagreement with. And there are many options that can be taken, some good and some bad. And we're going to discuss those in just a few moments. So remember, they were sent on their way and they were escorted some distance by the church, the delegation, and they traveled by land. And on the way to Jerusalem, they visited fellow believers in Phoenicia and Samaria. And on the way, they encountered these believers that are actually rejoicing. They're excited about the gospel reaching beyond their group of people. And this is such a contrast to the teachers from Judea. You have the Judean religious people. Not only are we shown here that they are in the minority, but that joy is the appropriate response to news that persons of any cultural group have come to salvation. One of the best litmus tests for the presence of salvation in our hearts is whether there is joy in the overflow and the news that another one has found Jesus. So they get to Jerusalem and the leaders welcome the delegation. Peter offers a speech. He shares of those who have come to Christ outside of the Jewish believers and reminds the church that some time ago, God did choose him to be the mouthpiece by which the Gentiles and non-Jewish believers would hear the gospel and come to saving faith. And he points to the divine acceptance that God, who knows the heart of a person's true spiritual state, gave the Holy Spirit to them as he had to Jewish believers at Pentecost. Peter strongly opposes the view that only acceptable outward evidence of the conversion of Gentiles is their willingness to be circumcised and live as Jews. See, up until that point, the vast majority of Jewish Christians believe that once those outside of the Jewish faith came to Christ, that they would become Jewish, that they had to become Jewish in order to be a Jew that was a Christian. But you see, they missed the point altogether. 
God is expanding a salvation to those outside of the Jewish culture and customs. And that's why we have salvation today. Jesus came to bring salvation, to bring freedom, possibly using the Gentiles as a standard. Peter declares that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we believe we are to be saved, not by our works. This is so, so important. And this moment that Peter shares these things, it brings silence to the room. They can sense and feel the moment. And they're handling this this disagreement so well that they're not just turning their backs on each other and walking away. They're taking it forward and doing what they need to do. And James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, is pretty much the head of the church there in Jerusalem at the time. He confirms what Peter is saying. And they also bring some wisdom to the Jewish Christians. By saying, you know, listen, we're not going to require them to be a part of our customs in order to know Jesus. Uh, But likewise, you know, Gentiles, those outside of the Jewish faith, you you have a responsibility too. Don't do anything that's going to make your brother stumble. Don't, Don't eat things that would be insensitive to the Jewish people. If we can lay aside our personal preferences, if we can sacrifice, you know, our own freedom per se in those moments. We can respect each other and have peace. It's so easy today with our environment, technology, goodness, our transportation, social media, especially in the middle of a pandemic. It makes it so easier to stay apart than to face the challenge of living together as a multicultural body of believers. I would argue that the church has yet been the model consistently of what James is calling for, but Even our separate fellowships may face challenges. Culturally, when this happens, we need to look back at Acts 15 and take it to heart. You know, I really truly believe that Christ made it very clear how important peace is. Years ago, I came across a ministry called Peacemakers Ministry, and they helped me in a very real way to understand the importance of reconciliation and the consequences of not being reconciled. If you have an issue with someone as a believer, you do not have the freedom to just ignore it. Now, you can ignore it, but you shouldn't. You see, there's two extremes here. You know, in conflict, when, when there's unmet desires, there's a slippery slope. You have on one side, there's going to be conflict when there's unmet desires. There are escape responses, as you can see here. You can deny that there's a problem. You can flee from it. Or even worse, an option is suicide. These are all options. These are all choices of how to respond to conflict. And on the opposite side, there are attack responses. There's assault upon disagreement. There there could be litigation. There's even murder. These are also responses to conflict. Which do you choose? Because we all choose a response in conflict. What we ought to know as Christians is that Jesus calls us into the middle here. And there are responses that we can look at. There you can either overlook a minor issue. You can seek reconciliation. There can be negotiation, meditation, arbitration, or accountability. These are what are called peacemaking responses. The definition of reconciliation is to restore to friendship or harmony. This is where peace comes in. This is where God wants us And there are spiritual implications to not being at peace with one another. But this is what Christ wants. If we look at scriptures, we read that if anyone is unfolded in Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order is gone. It's vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new, and God has made all things. He's reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. In other words... It was through the anointed one, through Jesus, that God was taking care of the world, not not even keeping records of their transgressions. And he has entrusted that to us. This ministry that we have opened the door of reconciliation to God. And that is so important. We must be reconciled to him. And we also know that there are spiritual implications that come when we aren't reconciled to him or each other. Peter asked Jesus one time, how many times do I have to forgive? And how many times do I have to forgive my fellow believers that keep offending me? Seven? And Jesus said, no, Peter, 
70 times 7. The lessons of forgiveness in heaven's kingdom is so important. We know that according to God's word, anger can bring disunity. And in Matthew chapter 5, it says, do not murder. You'll be judged. But I'm telling you, even if you hold anger in your heart towards another believer, you're subject to judgment. And whoever demeans and brings insults to fellow believers is answerable to authority. And whoever calls down curses upon fellow believers is in danger of hell. So that if you're presenting an offering before the Lord and and suddenly you remember that there had been a quarrel you had with a fellow believer, leave your gift there and go and take care and apologize with the one who is offended. This is what God's word says. Then after you've reconciled, come to the altar and present it. So what do I do? What do I do if I've had a disagreement with a believer? You know, one of the worst feelings in the world that I could possibly have is when I have a disagreement with my wife, Deanna. You know, when we have some type of conflict with each other, it's the worst. There's a wedge. You can feel it. There is no peace. I can't even sleep. And when we come together and we put aside our differences and seek a common ground, and we take responsibility for our words, our actions, and we restore that relationship, we have that peace. Not only do we have that with each other, but that's that's how we should respond to God. I've seen it time and time again in my life that when I just humble myself, even if I feel like I wasn't wrong, if I feel that way, it doesn't necessarily mean it was true, but if I feel that way, but if I just humble myself and approach the person who I had an issue with, or had an issue with me, if I just come in humility and and ask, you know, have I done anything that could have offended you? Will you forgive me? It opens up this incredible door and conversation to reconciliation. Through that act of humility, it brings peace. You know, I'm setting aside my differences here. I'm setting aside my freedom to say, I want this relationship restored. I know how important it is for us. I, I know how important it is. And I know how important it is for my growth and the Lord and those around me. This, this, let's take care of this. And sometimes it's hard to swallow your pride. It's hard to swallow mine, but it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. So with all that being said, I promised you these practical steps to peacemaking. And I want to let them, I want to give them to you now. As Christians, we believe that we are called to respond to conflict in a way that is completely and remarkably different from the world and the way they deal with conflict. We also believe that conflict provides opportunities to glorify God, to serve other people, and really our ultimate goal, to grow, to be like Christ. So we should commit ourselves in responding to conflict according to his principles. So number one, glorify God. And that may seem super meta, but I promise you, instead of focusing on your own desires or dwelling on what others may do, rejoice in the Lord and bring him praise by depending on his forgiveness, wisdom, power, and love as you seek to faithfully obey his commands and maintain a loving, merciful, and forgiving attitude. Let that be the core. Let that be the focus. Let that be the start. I want to glorify God because I need to glorify God. Second, get the log out of your own eye first. I know you heard this passage, right? Where if you're going to go to someone, make sure you deal with the speck of dust in in their eye that you have to take out the two by four in your own. It's kind of a cliche, but the purpose of this is by getting the log out of your own eye instead of blaming others for a conflict, regardless of who's at fault or resisting correction, you, you, you've got to trust God's mercy. you got to take responsibility for your own contribution to the efforts. As minor as you may feel, they are non-existent. Confessing your sins to those who have wronged, that'd be the first step you take. Asking God to help you change any attitude, any habits, that led to this conflict and seek to repair the harm that may have caused. Start with you. Search yourself. Search your heart. Look for it. Look to see what might be going on there first and begin there. Number three, gently restore. 
Instead of pretending that the conflict doesn't exist or talking about others behind their backs, we will overlook minor offenses. Or we will talk personally and graciously with those whose offenses seem too serious to overlook. You should seek to restore them rather than condemn them. When a conflict with a Christian brother or sister cannot be resolved in private, we ask others in the body of Christ to help us settle the matter in a more biblical manner. The book of Matthew lays out this incredible, incredibly well in chapter 18. I encourage you to go check that out. One of the great beautiful reasons to help foster this sense of unity and peace among each other is because in peace, we can have far greater success. We can accomplish way more in peace than in conflict. So we're shown how to do that. Okay, so gently restore and then finally go and be reconciled. Instead of accepting premature compromise or allowing relationships to just wither away, you should actively pursue genuine peace and reconciliation. Forgiving others is what God wants for us, and he's given that to us. This goes back to the Jerusalem Council, putting your differences aside, putting your cultural things aside and saying, listen, what really matters here? What's the core? When you do these things, when you make relationships right again, that peace, the words bring such a tangible feeling to it. It even just sounds peaceful. That peace is so important. Take it, run with it, embrace it. Take it and face it in conversations that you have. Because on the other side of that is peace. And it's not easy. No one said it would be, but it's possible. It's real. It matters so much, so, so much. Just remember the first step is probably the most important to glorify God and then be completely non judgmental and non defensive with the other person you're reconciling with. And let the other person know that they and what they say matters to you. When feelings are already hurt, it just takes one bump to bring back all the negativity. When you're bruised, when you're cut, and let's say you just accidentally bump into it with something, it just brings back all the pain. So be non-defensive, be non-judgmental. Now, let's put all this together. Jesus prayed this exact same thing in John 17, that the body of Christ would be unified with each other in the same way that he himself is unified with his Father. The implication is that when people see us, they've seen him. And if they don't believe us on account of our words, they should believe us on account of our works, on our on account of our actions. Because we are to do greater works. And Jesus said that we would do greater works than he did. That is the kind of unity that will cause the world to know that the kingdom of God has come near to them. And that he is real and that his love is real. His peace is real. And that there is power in him. So right now, I, I want to pray for you. And during this prayer, I want you to think. Think of maybe the person or persons whom you've had some sort of wedge in your relationship with. You know, there's not peace evident there. Because I promise you, that situation whether it's long forgotten or buried deep within, it's going to affect your relationships or it's going to affect your worship with God. You don't want anything standing in the way of that. But most importantly, that person may need to see the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the peace of God in action in order to be drawn closer to him. Maybe this is what you need to be drawn closer to God. Let's just take a few moments and, and ask God to reveal to you the people that you may need to seek peace and re reconciliation with. And then when we're done, here in just a few moments, I encourage you to reach out to that person. Pick up the phone, write a letter, speak to them. Open up your heart in the ways that God's word has laid out for us. Let us be a church that's it's not defined by walls, but let us be a church and a people who seek to do things in unity that focuses on the things that have eternal value, that we lay aside our preferences. It's not about us. Our, our identity is in Christ and Christ alone. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for this time together. And God, 
I believe you are already laying on our hearts right now who we need to reconcile with. And I ask God that we commit in this moment to pursue unity, to pursue peace, so that your word may continue to travel far and wide and that our lives will be a testimony of your peace and will. You've shown us in your word how important that is. You've shown us how in your word how important it is to to work together and put aside our differences and focus on what is right and what is true. And God, we just ask that you would work through our obedience to your word, that our relationships will be restored. Our relationship with you will be restored and that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, listen, reach out. If you have any questions, you can email me at josh.anders at thepointchurch.net. And I would love, 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 love to pray with you. You know, if you're looking for more guidance and counsel, you're certainly welcome to reach out to us. But would you do us a favor and just leave us a comment below or fill out a connect card and let us know how we can help. We're here for you. And hey, we're excited. Next Sunday, we are back, baby. We are back in person. It's been since Thanksgiving, and I'm excited to see what God is going to do. If you're local and you feel like it's right for you and your family, we'd love to see you then. Otherwise, we'll be online. And here's Deanna with some more information. Amen. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, We would really love to see you guys fill out that connection card at thepointchurch.net slash connect today. Before you leave here, make sure you do that. However we can help you move closer to God, we absolutely want to do it. So just decide today how that move looks for you. And then we can reach out to you once you reach out to us. And so we can partner with you through the resources and really just give you lots of prayer and even encouragement. And you may even want to try out giving for the first time while you're there. And man, I'm telling you, I really hope that if you haven't tried giving before, then you absolutely try it this this month or this year. God is so good to allow us to partner with Him. And we've just made giving very, very easy. Thepointchurch.net slash give. On that website, you're able to electronically give with a credit or debit. Or feel free to drop by our Bastard campus Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Someone will be here to receive your gift or text uh, to give at the number below, whichever way you choose. Thank you so much for continuing to give uh, with confidence and faith. Or you can also just come back uh, next week. We have our welcome back service. Yay, so excited. Welcome back service next week, 9, 10, 15, 11, 30. You can give in person too. That'd be so great to be with you again. And hey, we are still gonna be here online as well. So if you're just like, I don't know, not ready to like step out, feel free to meet us here on all of our platforms. We'll be live in all three services as well. Uh, Finally, share this message, like and subscribe to YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram if you haven't done it already. We have new content coming out even even that we're meeting again. So we will still have content. You never want to miss it. If you miss any of our past messages in this series, you can always catch them on demand on all of those platforms. We have a brand new series starting next week, so uh, I'm super excited for us to hop into that. It's gonna be a great time to invite some folks to church to the welcome back service, and especially at the beginning of a series. I mean, it's really, really great. So I'll see you guys next time. Bye.